Good afternoon. I would like to welcome you to today's lecture by Mark Kramer. I'm Klaus Laris. I'm the Richard M. Krasner Distinguished Professor in History and International Affairs here at the University of North Carolina in sunny Chapel Hill. I think it's particularly sunny today, luckily. I would like to thank Richard Kressner and the generous sponsors behind the Kressner Distinguished Professorship for making possible this lecture series today entitled The US in World Affairs, the Cold War and Beyond. I would also like to thank our camerawoman, Mary Walters over there, and I would like to acknowledge the tremendous help and support I've received from the Department of History and from our Center for European Studies. In a few days' time, the lecture today will hopefully be available on YouTube and also on the UNC websites. It is a great pleasure and honor to welcome Professor Mark Kramer today. Mark is one of the foremost experts on the Cold War in the United States, if not the world. Due to his linguistic skills, Mark has been able to conduct archival research in most Eastern European countries, um, in the Soviet Union, and indeed in America and uh, uh, Western European archives. He has thus become one of America's leading and most prolific Cold War historians. If Mark is not working at Harvard, he can often be found at international conferences on the Cold War all over the world. And I'm very pleased that he found the time to visit us today. And he also is kind enough to conduct a seminar with my graduate students tomorrow evening. Mark Kramer is the Director of Cold War Studies at Harvard University. He has been at Harvard and at the Davis Center at Harvard for the past 25 years, but he has also found the time to, taught at Yale, to teach at Yale, Brown and at Aarhus University in Denmark. Mark has published widely, in particular on the Cold War in the East. He is also the editor of the Journal of Cold War Studies, one of the leading journals in the field. And he runs the book series Harvard Cold War Studies, published by Raumann and Littlefield. Today, Mark Kramer will talk about Cold War myth and realities, <coughs> understanding today's threats and challenges in historical perspective. There will be plenty of time for questions afterwards. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to present Professor Mark Kramer to you. Uh, th thank you very much, Klaus, and thank you everyone for coming today. Um, I'm here from somewhat uh, normally less sunny Boston, although even in Boston it was, it was uh, sunny today. So I'm, I'm really especially pleased to be here in North Carolina, my first time here at, actually at UNC. Chapel Hill, though, have dealt with many people here over the years, and um, am uh, very pleased to be able to uh, speak with students tomorrow as well. I'm going to um, I'm going to uh, have a PowerPoint here, although I'll, I'm going to be starting without it, but I will uh, be referring to it a bit later on. Although I'm I'm going to be presenting in a way that you even if you can't see the PowerPoint that well, you'll be able to follow what I'm saying. The uh, th the title that I gave for the talk does sum up in some degree what I'm going to be speaking about. The Cold War by the Cold War, I refer to roughly the period from 1945 to 1989. You can quibble about the, the dates uh, a bit, but basically the first four and a half decades after the Second World War, a uh, time when there was, uh, again, with some veering and degree of hostility, but a, a real confrontation between the United States and its allies and the Soviet Union and its East European uh, allies. And it led to the deployment of tens of thousands of nuclear weapons, among other consequences. And there was, there was not a direct military clash between the United States and the Soviet Union, but the repercussions of the Cold War still uh, are being felt today. Now, the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union a couple of years later brought crucial changes in the international system, but many of the issues and ideas connected with the the Cold War itself, that, that superpower confrontation after the Second World War, are relevant to many of the challenges the United States faces today. So what I'm going to be doing here is not trying to convey lessons about the Cold War, because I generally am averse to or skeptical of the notion of lessons from history. Generally what you find is that policymakers 
uh, cherry pick from the past to fit what they want to do anyway. Occasionally, knowledge of the past, though, is very useful, and it, particularly, I think, an accurate understanding of the first four and a half decades after the Second World War it will actually be useful for those formulating U.S. foreign policy, of whom I happily uh, am not one. The, um, and have, unlike uh, quite a few people at Harvard, I have no desire ever to be Secretary of State. The, um, <laughs> um, the aim, though, of what I will be doing here is, is really to look at a few persistent myths about the Cold War and to try to dispel some of those, but also to look at some of the major issues that existed during the Cold War that are sometimes thought to be unique to the post-Cold War world. Now, one of the most ten tenacious myths about the Cold War is that the United States consistently adhere to a broad strategy of containment, um, seeking to deter and, if necessary, rebuff attempts by Soviet or Soviet-backed communist forces to expand their influence beyond the countries that were occupied by Soviet troops in 1944-45, essentially most of Eastern Europe and North Korea. And, little bit, a uh, few other regions. Um, the, this has been, this notion of containment has led to numerous books on the topic. Uh, there were, I cite one of these, just, um, I won't even name the authors, uh, but the, there are two uh, professors of international relations at Jewish Washington University who wrote a book came out in 2008 about U.S. foreign policy. And in that book, they, <clears throat> and I quote it, during the long uh, twilight struggle, uh, they, they claim that U.S. foreign policy, quote, during the long twilight struggle against a single heavyweight rival was shaped by a single template, the overarching Cold War strategy to contain Soviet communism, <coughs> unquote. So again, the notion that there was this uh, single template for U.S. foreign policy of containment. That portrayal of U.S. foreign policy during the Cold War is far too simplistic and indeed I, I would argue simply wrong. Uh, U.S. foreign policy during the Cold War was never mechani uh, mechanistically guided by a quote single template unquote. In some important instances, the United States didn't even attempt to contain the spread of Soviet influence and instead simply acquiesced in the victories achieved by communist and leftist forces. Just months after uh, George Kennan's famous X article appeared in the July 1947 issue of Foreign Affairs, the, the uh, article that um, was published under the pseudonym X, but very quickly became known, was authored by Kennan. Just months after that article appeared, Soviet-backed communists seized power in Czechoslovakia in 1948 and China in 1949. The United States took no military or covert action to reverse those encroachments. U.S. inaction in such cases, whether wise or not, um, undoubtedly uh, wise to a degree, um, entailed significant costs. Declassified documents have revealed that the U.S. government's failure to try to undo the communist takeover in China, in particular, emboldened Stalin uh, and contributed to his decision in early 1950 to condone North Korea's plans for an attack on South Korea in June 1950. You can also look at uh, the outcome of the Cuban Missile Crisis, an event that this week, in fact, marks the 50th anniversary of it, when uh, the Soviet Union had deployed missiles to Cuba. There wasn't a single template that guided U.S. policy during that period. The Kennedy administration decided to make a crisis out of the deployment of the missiles, but ultimately agreed to a settlement that was largely on Soviet terms, even though the public diplomacy that went on afterward presented it as a U.S. victory. In fact, if you look at what Soviet objectives were in deploying the missiles, by and large, the settlement that resulted, which involved the, remo the uh, removal of U.S. Jupiter missiles from Turkey and Italy 
that that was not publicly part of the deal, but it was uh, secretly part of the arrangement, plus a U.S. pledge not to invade Cuba. Those were essentially reflected the objectives the Soviet Union had in it. So, so again, it reflects this notion that a single template isn't uh, what guided U.S. policy. When the United States did attempt to contain the spread of Soviet influence, the record was quite mixed. Um, the United States successfully rebuffed North Korea's uh, attempt to occupy South Korea in 19, 19, uh, early 1950s. Um, it also prevented Soviet inroads into Western Europe and Japan. But in other cases, U.S. efforts to prevent or reverse communist gains proved spectacularly unsuccessful, as in Cuba and Vietnam. Even in Afghanistan in the 1980s, U.S. covert aid to, uh, again, you know, the popular image of this has been guided by films and books that put, uh, portray it as having brought about the, uh, the, the, the provision of CIA aid to Afghan guerrillas achieved certain things that um, were detached from what actually was the case. U.S. covert aid to anti-communist guerrillas did not actually succeed in dislodging the communist regime there. Although the U.S.-backed resistance helped to spur Gorbachev's, Mikhail Gorbachev's decision to pull Soviet troops out of Afghanistan, the pro-Soviet communist regime in Kabul survived for several years after the Soviet withdrawal. In fact, they outlived the uh, Soviet Union itself, in part because the Soviet Union continued to provide huge quantities of military and economic support. And it wasn't until after the Soviet Union collapsed and the Russian government under Boris Yeltsin abruptly cut off aid to the Afghan government um, that the communist regime in Kabul collapsed. The notion that containment was the single template for U.S. foreign policy during the Cold War is also belied by the numerous instances when the United States went well beyond simply attempting to curb the spread of Soviet or leftist influence. At various points throughout the Cold War, the United States actively tried to roll back Soviet or pro-Soviet forces in, in numerous ways. Um, in some instances, by secretly helping anti-communist guerrillas in the three Baltic uh, republics of the Soviet Union, the newly annexed Baltic republics, in Poland in, uh, and in Albania, all of those efforts failed miserably. Um, but they were attempted. That was during the Truman administration, which supposedly was the originator of containment. Rollback, again, was always uh, part of this notion, at least through the mid-1950s. The, uh, the United States also relied on covert operations in Iran. This, was, um, except, uh, I know, has been discussed in a previous lecture by Richard Immerman, but the, um, this came to the fore during the Eisenhower administration. It had begun under Truman, but um, really came to the fore where the operations, say, in Iran in 1953, in Guatemala in 1954, in, uh, later on in Indonesia in 1965, in Chile in 1973, in Angola in 1975. Uh, so again, it's a reflection that it went beyond simply containment, it was an effort to roll back. Um, in some instances, these efforts proved to be of enduring success. The uh, United States also undertook unilateral military action uh, on occasion during the Cold War. Most notable, these were mostly minor engagements um, in the Dominican Republic in 1965 and in Grenada in 1983. The United States uh, also successfully used diplomatic means in the provision of economic and military assistance to forge amicable ties with countries that had broken away from the Soviet sphere on their own. Uh, in particular, Yugoslavia after 1948 when the United States began selling arms to Yugoslavia, providing military equipment and training, to uh, Indonesia after 1965, after there was a, a, uh, coup, a quite bloody coup in Indonesia against the Soviet-backed government uh, there of Sukarno. Um, in China, with China in the 1970s, after a bitter split 
had emerged between the Soviet Union a uh, decade earlier, between the Soviet Union and China in the 1970s. The United States uh, established formal relations with China and tried to use it as a counterweight to Soviet power. And then uh, Egypt after 1973. In short, then, the widespread view that U.S. foreign policy invariably fit a single pattern during the Cold War, a pattern that compelled the United States, and again I quote from this book that I mentioned before by uh, Chalet and Goldgeier, um, that to impose, and I quote it, impose one grand theory on global politics. That's simply then uh, incorrect, or at least it, it simplifies U.S. foreign policy to a degree that is at best misleading. Uh, U.S. policymakers often showed, and indeed had to show, considerable flexibility and couldn't rigidly adhere to a single template. Uh, no such template would have been feasible because there was often no consensus during the Cold War about key aspects of U.S. foreign policy. Again, one of the myths of the Cold War period is that there was always a consensus on the need to, uh, to, to confront Soviet power. Um, that seems a little bit ridiculous to people who actually lived through, say, the protests of the Vietnam era, even going back earlier to the um, to the discord that arose over the fighting of the Korean War, but particularly during Vietnam and subsequent periods of very heated contention over the nature of U.S. foreign policy and the uh, the very way that it was being, um, the, the not only the objectives itself, but also the way it was being, per, they were being pursued. So for, uh, again, during the uh, deployment of, of uh, Euro missiles in the early 1980s, it was much more contentious in Western Europe, but still within the United States as well, a nuclear freeze movement arose. Um, more contentious later in the 1980s was the, uh, the um, enormous bickering that went on over the provision of covert aid to guerrillas in Nicaragua. The, uh, all of those um, controversies surrounding U.S. the goals and uh, um, means of pursuing those goals in U.S. foreign policy belie the notion that, the, uh, that there was real bipartisanship partisanship throughout the Cold War. That was, it was to a degree in the 1950s, but that was far more the exception than the norm. So what, in looking then at uh, current U.S. foreign policy or U.S. foreign policy in the 21st century, if it does suggest that it's, again, it's not an attempt to derive a lesson, but it does suggest that if there was no overarching strategy or single template um, that was feasible or desirable during the Cold War. It again suggests that you don't particularly need a single strategy or a template uh, for the post-Cold War era as well, that a degree of flexibility is probably better to have. Similarly, a consensus about the goals and means of U.S. foreign policy is almost never guaranteed in advance and isn't necessarily desirable even if it does exist. It can lead to a consensus about doing stupid things. The, uh, the best way to generate, de there, I'll come back to that a bit later about the art of doing nothing, which can sometimes be better than doing some, something stupid. The, uh, the best way to generate a durable consensus is by pursuing policies that are successful. Sometimes those policies aren't necessarily desirable, but if they're successful, they usually will achieve a consensus. In the lead up to the uh, 1991 Gulf War, the, the war to drive Iraqi forces out of Kuwait, public and congressional opposition was strong, unlike before the 2003 uh, Iraq war when public uh, support was, was quite strong. Prior to the 1991 Gulf War, it was about evenly split. There was significant opposition and there was very strong opposition in Congress, especially among Democrats. But after the U.S. military deployed overwhelming force and drove Iraqi troops out of Kuwait quickly and decisively in early 1991, Republican congressional support for the war so, uh, soared. Uh, 
By contrast, public and congressional support for the Vietnam War was strong at the outset, and, and again for the 2003 Iraq War was strong at the outset, but steadily dwindled as the war dragged on for years without a conclusive outcome. So what that suggests again is that consensus isn't a prerequisite for foreign policy success, but, uh, but the converse is true, that success is a prerequisite for a lasting consensus. Now again, you can have success with policies that aren't necessarily desirable, but if your goal is to achieve a consensus, you're probably best off by trying to pursue policies that are successful. Um, third, most of the supposedly new challenges, and what I'll be turning to now, most of the supposedly new challenges and threats of the post-Cold War era, uh, international terrorism, anti-Americanism, <coughs> crises in NATO, nuclear terrorism, nuclear proliferation, all of these things existed during the Cold War. In some cases, the severity of them was greater, as I, as I will get to. Um, in fact, I, in looking at all of the ones I just mentioned, which I'll go through now, the, uh, you could argue that the problems were worse during the post-Cold War era. So that does, um, is, before getting to that, it does lead me to ask why when the Cold War ended did some observers express such reservations about what the new era would be like. This began in July or the summer of 1990 issue of International Security, an article that was published by John Mearsheimer at, at the University of Chicago. It was titled Back to the Future? Question mark, which played on a film that was out at that point about a time machine. For There are some people too young, and I think in the room who are too young to remember that film. But the, uh, um, but the idea was the that uh, uh, Western countries and in general the international system would be um, more dangerous, that greater threats would arise. And I know in the class that I'll be meeting tomorrow, they have read that article because I asked them to read it. And uh, we'll be going through and looking at where um, certain things that Mearsheimer said proved wide of the mark, which is essentially everything he said in that <laughs> <laughs> But the, uh, uh, similarly, um, Jim Woolsey, James Woolsey, who is um, Bill, uh, Bill Clinton's first CIA director, testified before Congress just after um, the, administ the Clinton administration took office in early 1993, and he said that the post-Cold War world was more dangerous than the uh, Cold War had been more dangerous. Um, so the, there has uh, been this sense that the, law, the there were certain things that the end of the Cold War meant. It meant that the uh, main military counterweight on the United States, on U.S. action in the world, was gone. And that created the opportunity for the United States to do certain things. It might not do them, but it created the opportunity for it to do certain things like pursue the 1991 Gulf War. Um, it had greater freedom of action overall. It didn't necessarily, that doesn't necessarily mean that leeway will be used wisely though, and I'll come back to that. The, uh, in, lo in looking though at some of the, the threats and challenges that, whoops, Okay, I, I realize I'm not going to expect you to read all of this. I just wanted to put it up in case um, someone wanted to look at it. As I say, I will ensure that if you can't see it well, you'll still have a sense of what I'm talking about. The, uh, the Cold War crises, among other things, which in, often didn't pose a threat of a direct war, but it, to some degree did. It, there was some risk of military confrontation. And I've listed here uh, many of the crises that involved U.S. and uh, the United States and the Soviet Union, in some cases other countries, um, especially China as well, plus the countries that were the, uh, the arenas of these crises. 
So it began almost immediately with Iran in 1946, continuing on with, uh, uh, with Turkey and then the, uh, Ber the Berlin crisis, the initial Berlin crises, 1948-49. I won't go through all of these other than to say that um, almost uh, every year or every other year in the Cold War, there was either a crisis or the prospect that one could emerge. The Berlin crisis, for example, continued well into the 1960s before a semi-solution was found, uh, which was the building of the Berlin Wall. And numerous other crises did involve use of military force, the Korean War, the uh, suppression of the East German uprising in 1953, the Soviet invasion of Hungary in 1956, um, and numerous, uh, almost all of the others. So in addition to these crises, though, there were the, uh, and these overlap to a degree, these horrendously destructive wars. If you were living in the United States and the Soviet Union, you might not be fighting the other country, but there were some countries, the Koreas, the Vietnams, who experienced huge casualties as a percentage of their population. The uh, Middle East wars, similarly, and uh, the civil wars that emerged, they weren't um, in, in Africa. Those were partly a product of decolonization, but they were certainly fueled by the Cold War because the rival sides um, armed the contending parties. And um, so they were greatly exacerbated by the Cold War, even if they weren't solely caused by it. Um, the uh, Soviet-Afghan War in the 1980s, again, you're talking about a war that led to to about a, uh, one, one and a half million people dead. In total, these wars killed about 22 million people, which is, you know, half the total in the Second World War, roughly. Um, so it, again, it wasn't equivalent to the Second World War, which is a much more compressed uh, period of killing, but there was a great deal of bloodshed that occurred. There was also tyranny and oppression that existed all during the Cold War with the divide of Europe, the uh, parts, in, in including that the United States, under pressure of the Cold War, supported dictatorships in various parts of the world, especially Latin America and uh, East Asia. It, didn't, it did at times press for liberalization in those countries, but um, not always uh, very hard and not always with success. Most of all, though, um, in thinking about threats and challenges of the post-Cold War world, that this um, in particular now is essentially gone. It's not fully, it still exists at least in principle, but it's essentially gone. A threat, though, that people living during the Cold War were constantly mindful of. Again, the 50th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis this week brings to mind what was clearly the most dangerous crisis of the Cold War, a time when nuclear war came perilously close. It's, it's disturbing to go back and look at that crisis to see how close the two sides actually came to a major, uh, terribly destructive nuclear war that probably would have killed several hundred million people. Um, that's the type of thing that in the post-Cold War world, when Jim Woolsey says it's more dangerous, this fortunately uh, belies his claim. Um, let me turn then to look briefly at some of the other things that are often talked about as unique to the post-Cold War world, but to look back on these and show that actually they existed during the Cold War and that were um, that some of them emerged directly as a result of the Cold War. Uh, international terrorism, um, the, if you look at the incidence uh, of the number of attacks, number of people killed by international terrorism, it was considerably higher during the Cold War. Um, some of this was concentrated in particular periods, but it began in the 1960s, going back a little bit earlier, but particularly in the 60s with hijackings of the aircraft, which were very common uh, 
until the early 1970s. They came to an end largely because of security procedures that we now take for granted going into an airport when you go through security screening. <coughs> that um, either didn't exist or was much lighter until uh, the 1960s. The introduction of that, though, greatly reduced the number of hijackings. Other types of terrorist uh, attacks, though, were much harder to combat, especially with the rise of Middle East terrorism in the 19, uh, mid, starting in the mid-1960s, prior to the 1967 war, I should say, but escalating after the 1967 war, with the emergence of groups like Black September, in particular, which perpetrated the, the uh, massacre in Munich, um, uh, 40 years ago, the uh, murder of Israeli Olympic athletes, plus numerous other grisly attacks were, were attributed to Black September. Uh, there were affiliated groups and some that were like the Japanese Red Army that worked on behalf of Black September and the uh, Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. The, there were, the period of just 1971 to 1972 alone, there were dozens of such attacks that occurred. The assassination of the Jordanian Prime Minister Abbas Vital uh, in, in December of 1971, the massacre at Lod Airport in Israel in May of 1972, um, that was carried out by the Japanese Red Army faction, but working in the league with Black September. <laughs> the uh, massacre of Israeli athletes, again, which I already alluded to, and the um, this in particular I found interesting because in 2006, when there was a uh, terrorist plot discovered or broken up, I should say, by um, in in Britain to bring explosives on board and uh, in bottles or liquids, which is why now you're limited to three ounces of liquids as you hear incessantly when you go into an airport. And the, uh, that plot though actually had its predecessor during uh, Black September's head, uh, heyday when Black September terrorists were trying to bring explosives on in perfume bottles. The FBI broke up this plot, this was in 1972, but the uh, the thing that I had to wonder was why 34 years later there hadn't been technology devised to search for uh, liquid explosives. The, um, uh, there were, in addition, beyond those attacks in the 1970s, in the 1980s there were Islamic Jihad attacks. This was, uh, had its worst consequences in 1983 during the attack on the U.S. Marine barracks in Lebanon and close to 250 Marines were, were uh, killed in October of 1983. And then there was terrorism in Western Europe that, uh, as archival materials show, were those terrorists in many cases were armed by Soviet bloc countries, especially by the East Germans, but also by the Bulgarians and Czechoslovak state security forces. The, um, so the, again, if you look at uh, all of these sources of terrorism, they were considerably greater both in the numbers killed and in the number of attacks and in the post-Cold War period. With nuclear proliferation as well, this was um, that article I mentioned by John Mearsheimer deals considerably with nuclear proliferation. He expected that Germany um, and several other European countries would develop nuclear weapons, Ukraine, um, possibly Poland, uh, and so forth. He, he expected this to happen and actually thought it should. The, um, but if you look at the rate of nuclear proliferation during the Cold War, it was considerably higher again. Uh, during the Cold War, there were the, um, the initial nuclear proliferation began with the United States in 1945, then continued the Soviet Union in 1949, uh, Britain in 1952, France in 1960, China in 1964. India detonated what it called a nuclear device in 1974. It said it wasn't a nuclear weapon, but as anyone 
who looks at nuclear weapons technology knows the only difference between a nuclear device and a nuclear bomb is that you call it a device. <laughs> the, the, uh, um, there were also, in addition, unannounced nuclear powers, countries that didn't conduct nuclear tests, but uh, we do know now, uh, uh, especially in the case of South Africa, developed nuclear weapons. This would include uh, Israel, South Africa, Pakistan. Um, the, uh, Pakistan, though, I'll put into the post-Cold War period since it didn't conduct its first nuclear test until 1998. But um, Iraq, similarly, was on the verge of acquiring nuclear weapons by early 1991. So you can argue, at least with uh, eight countries, had acquired nuclear weapons during, uh, during the Cold War. The, uh, it was a rate of roughly every five years or so. If you look at the post-Cold War world, where you see that North Korea has conducted nuclear tests, and I'll put Pakistan there as well. Um, Iran is working actively toward developing nuclear weapons, but hasn't yet tested one. So we're really talking about two new countries. Plus, you have to subtract South Africa, which gave up its nuclear weapons program. So there's been a net increase of one country in the post-Cold War period, and now extending for over 20 years. So again, the rate has been considerably slower. Some of the things that are talked about now, like the possibility of a preemptive strike against Iran's nuclear weapons facilities, also arose during the Cold War. There was debate about whether to attack China's nuclear weapons facilities. Israel did attack Iraq's uh, nuclear weapon, um, West Iraq nuclear facility in 1981. There was debate about how effective that strike was, but it, it actually was carried out. So again, there's nothing particularly new about that. Similarly, during the Cold War, the United States restrained certain countries, its allies, for the most part, from developing their own nuclear weapons. Uh, West Germany, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan were among countries that considered it developing their own nuclear weapons, and certainly could have, um, but uh, chose not to, in part because of a U.S. nuclear guarantee. And that, to a degree, continues uh, now. The, uh, <clears throat> let me, I'll move more quickly through this, because I want to leave ample time for questions and discussion. Is, uh, on, with regard to nuclear terrorism, here too, this is often talked about going back to Woolsey's presentation. He raised the issue of nuclear terrorism in his testimony before Congress. But in fact, during the Cold War, this was an issue that was looked at very closely by the intelligence community. The, there were classified CIA and Defense Department sponsored studies of nuclear terrorism that go back to essentially the beginning of the nuclear age. Uh, the, uh, the first one that's been declassified, at least, is from 1951. It's actually quite a good study. It, um, you know, you're talking about something that's now uh, 61 years old, but it actually still is quite relevant even to now. The concern there was that the Soviet Union would provide nuclear bombs to terrorists um, or who would then be able to smuggle it into the United States and detonate it without having a, a, a conclusive direct tie to the Soviet Union. Or they would be able to bring it into a U.S. harbor or across a border. These, again, are all issues that are being looked at now, but they've been looked at for 60 years. Um, it does, again, show you that some of these problems are just very difficult to counter if you're dealing with people who can actually do it. The basic thing that has kept that from being achieved is, is not so much good intelligence, although that has certainly helped. It's, it's simply that uh, developing such weapons for terrorists is extremely difficult. Threats of nuclear terrorism in, 19, in the 1960s and especially the 1970s loomed large for U.S. intelligence officials because of Black September, which had claimed that it wanted to develop its own nuclear weapons. And there were numerous books that appeared at the time about nuclear terrorism. It's something like the raft of books that have appeared in the post-Cold War period, but 
But again, if you compare these books, they essentially are talking about the same problem. And in fact, there has been a good deal of reinvention of the wheel. Um, there was concern as well during the Cold War that Pakistan or rogue elements in the Pakistani military would provide nuclear weapons technology to Islamic terrorists. That, again, is a very much a concern and a legitimate concern today. But it, uh, there is nothing new about it. That goes back to the 1980s. Let me look um, also at... Let me look quickly at anti-Americanism during the Cold War, because here, too, um, there was a, a notion that somehow this was just a product of George W. Bush's administration, and that the United States during the Cold War had been loved in the world. Um, this is the notion that you often find, or that sort of simplistic thesis is reflected in things like Tom Friedman's columns in the New York Times and others. Um, it's not to say the Bush administration clearly exacerbated this sentiment, but, it, but again, it is something that has waxed and waned during the, uh, that did wax or wane throughout the Cold War. Joe Nye at Harvard has spoken about cycles of anti-Americanism, which I think is an accurate way to characterize it during the Cold War, that there were cycles that were intense. Um, especially during the Vietnam War. But even going back to a period when most people look back on it as a time that the United States was greatly respected in the world, but John Dos Passos went to, uh, the, during the initial months after the Second World War, went through Europe and wrote a series of articles for the New Yorker about this. The title of the, his articles, I think, is telling. He said, how we are losing World War II. And by that, he meant that essentially the United States was being blamed for the terrible misery, economic misery and upheaval that still existed in much of Europe at that time. Let me quote from his, uh, uh, just briefly from his articles. He says, quote, never has American prestige in Europe been lower and a bit later, he says, friend and foe alike look you accusingly in the face and tell you how bitterly they are disappointed in you as an American. They cite the evolution of the word liberation. Before the Normandy landings, it meant to be freed from the tyranny of the Nazis. Now it stands in the minds of the civilians for one thing, looting. And, and you think about, you know, in Iraq in 2003, it could have been, that could have been written about something of that sort. Similarly, uh, during the solarium study at the start of the Eisenhower administration, the effort to, to go back and reassess U.S. foreign policy after with the settlement of the Korean War and other important changes that had gone on, that uh, study, and again I'll quote from it, uh, it warned that U.S. prestige has continued to decline the United States and Europe are developing, and again I'm quoting, profound divergences in views regarding important problems in Europe and other areas of the world. Europeans believe that Americans view the international scene only through the prism of black or white. And, that, uh, and, many, uh, and many Europeans beyond the communist fringe are beginning to call for our Americans go home, and with the exclamation point. Um, and, uh, President Eisenhower himself, the following year, reflected concern about this sentiment when he wrote a letter to his brother Milton, a college president, and uh, President Eisenhower said, and I quote from his letter, in some areas of the world we are believed to be bombastic, jingoistic, and totally devoted to the theories of force and power as the only worthwhile elements in the world, unquote. That's the type of thing where you wonder whether George W. Bush wrote something similar to Jeb Bush uh, at some point. Um, it could easily have been written. It's not to say, again, that, uh, that this type of sentiment um, existed always at an intense level during the Cold War. But by and large, there certainly were periods, especially during the Johnson administration, when it was even more intense than it ever was over the last decade. There were violent protests in Western Europe against the Vietnam War. 
the, uh, and many of those had a very strong anti-American uh, orientation to them. There was a war crimes tribunal that was being held in Stockholm, a somewhat farcical thing, but it uh, again reflected that sentiment. Um, there was outrage over the U.S. role in the coup d'etat, actually only a relatively small role, but in the U.S. coup d'etat in Greece in 1967. There were surveys done by the U.S. Information Agency about sentiment toward the United States. They're actually very useful surveys, and they were doing these uh, periodically. They're extremely useful sources of data for people interested in that kind of data analysis. But uh, President Johnson became so dismayed in, in his final year with uh, the strong anti-American sentiment that they were revealing that he actually put an end to those surveys. And unfortunately, they weren't resumed until the post-Cold War period. So there's that big gap from 1968 until uh, 1990. Um, so the basic point I would derive from that would be the United States as the dominant power in the world uh, was never loved during the Cold War and undoubtedly never will be and that if that is what people are hoping to <coughs> revive then they're hoping to revive a myth. Let me turn finally and then I will uh, open it up for questions. Will be Let me look at um, potential and actual compromises of values during the Cold War. And here too it was something that um, especially during George W. Bush's administration when, when there, were, uh, there were certain actions taken, especially some of the um, memoranda that were put out by the U.S. Justice Department essentially condoning the use or at least authorizing the use of torture. That um, this, again, these sorts of compromises were common, in fact, I would argue in some ways much more onerous during the Cold War. Now, if I had been a policymaker during that time, I might have made the same choices, but there's no doubt that U.S. values were compromised on numerous issues. This was um, partly a reflection about domestic subversion. Now, some of that was perfectly legitimate concern about domestic subversion. It was known that the Soviet Union from U.S. intercepts of Soviet intelligence cables. It was known that the Soviet Union had a very active espionage program in the United States. But this clearly got um, severely abused, especially by demagogues like uh, Senator McCarthy. Later on, there were excesses by the FBI under J. Edgar Hoover with the illegal wiretapping and break-ins, the blackmailing of politicians and judges, the uh, COINTELPRO, the, the counterintelligence program as it was known to disrupt the anti-war effort, the uh, and civil rights movement, and the uh, illegal surveillance of, of protests of various SUA. There were CIA abuses at home and abroad, with LSD and narcotics uh, experiments, uh, the ultra mind control experiments, quite a bizarre phase in CIA history. Um, the, there were manu the uh, torture memoranda that emerged in, in the more um, recent, the George W. Bush's administration, had something of an equivalent in manuals that were distributed to certain Latin American countries that outlined procedures for torture. They weren't authored by the CIA, but they were distributed. The Geneva Conventions was interesting. This arose during the, um, the war in Afghanistan initially. It also arose to a degree in Iraq, but, but particularly in the war in Afghanistan when, when uh, the George W. Bush administration talked about the Geneva Conventions at this point. There was a similar debate, though, during the Vietnam War. The Johnson administration debated whether to extend Geneva protections to Viet Cong prisoners, uh, Vietnam, uh, North, Viet, uh, North Vietnamese prisoners were accorded Geneva protections, but the, the real question was whether also to extend that to the communist guerrillas in the South. Ultimately, the administration did decide to do that, but there was considerable debate about whether to do it. And similarly, the so-called secret renditions were uh, common all during the Cold War, d dating back to the Eisenhower administration, the transfer of prisoners to countries 
in which interrogations were often quite brutal that didn't face the same legal restrictions the United States had. So in looking at all of these then, I would say despite the many trade-offs and compromises the United States felt, compa uh, felt compelled to make during the Cold War, U.S. officials were unwilling to emulate the Soviet Union in resorting to torture or other highly degrading forms of abuse. And John McCain in his memoir recalls that one of the main things that sustained him when he was being tortured brutally by his North Vietnamese captors in the early 1970s is that he knew he was fighting for a country that didn't engage in such practices. That is, I think, one important lesson. Uh, and McCain has constantly stressed that when he is arguing about torture is that the uh, reluctance to engage in it is not about those who are brought into U.S. captivity, many of whom have committed terrible acts, but it's, as he put it, it's about us. And that, I think, is a lesson from the Cold War that's worth upholding in all circumstances. But the, um, the uh, major thing in, uh, in bringing the talk to an end, I would say about this, is that one of the major myths about the Cold War is that um, somehow it was free of these sorts of things, or at least that these are much more acute during the post-Cold War period. In fact, these sorts of, tra of moral trade-offs and of uh, compromises of values were often far more severe and far harder to avoid during the Cold War. So in all of those respects then, looking back at the Cold War, at both the myths and the realities of it, I think we should be very thankful that it is over. And the nostalgia that was expressed for it beginning in 1990, but it continues to be to this day, I think is unwarranted. So, anyway, thank you, and I will be glad to take questions. Thanks very much, Mark. <laughs> Mark, for a very enlightening and deep talk. I took uh, two lessons from your talk, essentially. First of all, you don't want to become Secretary of State, which uh, we may or may not be grateful for. I don't know. There might be a job opening soon. And secondly, uh, <laughs> Joe and I can have it. And secondly, the difference between the Cold War and the post-Cold War era seems to be slight. That it really, you know, is not much of a divisive uh, turning point which just happened in 1990. Um, but maybe I'll open it okay. up. Let, you know, me, let, me, let me respond to that. To that. Okay. I, I think it is, there is, and, and I skipped over this somewhat um, quickly, but there is one major way though, the greater leeway for U.S. action in the world uh, to do certain things. And, and again, um, behaving foolishly is something the United States did during the Cold War as well. But there were constraints it faced on certain things it could do because of uh, the risk of confrontation with the Soviet Union. In the post-Cold War world, the removal of that constraint gives the United States greater leeway. And that's why people will focus on U.S. actions probably more vividly than they did during the Cold War. Okay, thank you. Let me open it um, to questions from you, the audience. Who would like to ask the first question? Yes, Please. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here. Um, but second of all, do you think that it's an unfair comparison just based on the fact that uh, the Cold War lasted a certain amount of time and the post-Cold War we haven't even gone to that yeah. similar time? It, no, it's a very fair point. That's why I did try to build in when I could some of those um, time comparisons. So, for example, with the uh, the post-Cold War period now has lasted, you know, again, you can quibble about the dates, I would say say 20, close to 25 years, 23 years. And so it's a, about half of what the Cold War was. You know, if you're going to say 23 years, it's about half. And that's why it is striking that even as technology has advanced, that there is only this net increase of one country that actually deploys nuclear weapons. Um, in, the, in the Cold War period, you know, there were, there were eight countries that deployed nuclear weapons. So it, it is, I think, in that sense, quite striking. But by and large, your point is absolutely correct that um, there are things about 
what will happen as, say, China emerges as a more confrontational power in East Asia, not only with the United States, it's probably less the case with the United States than with uh, Japan. Will Japan refrain from developing nuclear weapons? Will conflict be avoided? Uh, there, there are unanswered questions of that, so that will emerge only, say, over the next 22 years, 22, 23 years. Um, so I, I do accept that the so far the limited time that has passed in the post-Cold War period does have to um, qualify some of what I've said, but, but being half the time, it still allows you to say certain things. Thank you. Yes, please. You said there was a constraint uh, because of the fear of confrontation with the Soviet Union. How much of a constraint to U.S. foreign policy now is uh, instantaneous communication, the social, social media, CNN, Internet, all of that? No, it's, a, again, an excellent question. The, uh, there, there are certain ways in which it induces action. For example, it's much harder for the United States to stay out of conflicts that undoubtedly would have um, earlier, like Libya last year. Or, or even going back to what I think is probably the most striking case of this would be Kosovo in uh, 1999. If you look at the actual number of casualties in Kosovo, th this is the region of Serbia that is now since February 2008 been independent. But the uh, uh, Kosovo, which is predominantly inhabited by Albanians, there, there was repression that was going on in 1997, 98, 99, but the scale of it was, by the standards of some conflicts, say uh, Syria nowadays, was small. But U.S. action in intervening in Kosovo was spurred by precisely um, social media weren't were only in their infancy then, but the uh, the CNN effect and the internet certainly helped to drive U.S. responses. Similarly, the intervention in Libya last year with both the French and the British um, pushing the United States in part as a response to their public's pressure, the public from their own um, public uh, in, in having seen these events covered. So sometimes it's an inducement to action, but it also can be a real constraint. There's no doubt that uh, the Iraq War had it, the 2003 Iraq War had it been um, conducted at a time when it wasn't easy for people to see what was going on on television or through the internet, um, probably could have, would have generated much less controversy. So the, um, the, the ability of people to see things in what may be, an un, in the case of Kosovo, I think an unduly negative light, or to see them the way they really are, uh, as in Iraq, um, does constrain action. It means that it's harder to conduct certain policies and therefore policymakers will normally be more reluctant to undertake them in the future. I mean, again, any policymaker who is thinking nowadays about um, attacking Iran, uh, attacking Iran's nuclear weapons facilities has to be mindful of that, that this is going to be flashed on television. The Iranians will ensure it is, even if uh, It'll be hard for television crews to be there. They'll ensure that um, it is shown on TV, and it will. Um, there's no question it will generate opposition, even if the attack uh, kills very few people, and even if it's successful, it still will generate a great deal of opposition. I mean, the more um, the tighter constraints on action there are, the military options seem to be bad um, at this point. But still, the, the factor that you mentioned is if for the indefinite future is going to be a constraint on U.S. ability to conduct military operations and foreign policy more generally. Thank you. Dick, please. Um, some years ago, there emerged or seemed to emerge an interpretation that there were, there were two Cold Wars, a first half and a second half. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's still extant at all or it's been pursued in the scholarship something of a break in the late 60s or early 70s, mm -hmm. but this afternoon you've, you've talked about the Cold War holistically. What, what, what is your opinion of that uh, interpretation, that there's a fundamental break, that there's 
really a difference between mm -hmm. the first half and second half? Could no, I, I, I think that that is um, broadly correct. I don't want to overstate it, but I would maybe even break it into three phases. The first one being during the time that Stalin was alive. Um, after Stalin's death, there were important changes that occurred in both the Soviet Union and the Soviet bloc that uh, it certainly did not prevent crises, but it, it made at least the Soviet bloc less, um, seemingly less hostile than it had been. I would argue actually less hostile than it had been. Uh, under Stalin, it, it's hard for me to, in going back, and again, this is a, there's a whole controversy over the origins of the Cold War. It's hard for me to see, though, how that wartime alliance could have proven lasting given Stalin's objectives in Europe, which I think were um, sharply at odds with those of the United States and West European countries. It, I just don't see that it could have been lasting. It's, it could have extended for a longer period, perhaps, but, um, but so long as Stalin was alive, there was going to be a confrontation. After his death, uh, there were still severe crises, um, but there was also a greater willingness to uh, forge cooperative arrangements. Exchanges began in the 1950s, some of which continue to this day. The uh, various programs of scholarly exchange, scientific exchange, um, arms control treaties began to be, negotiations for them began to be pursued in the 1950s. However, in the early 1960s, there were the two severe crises, especially the one that, uh, again, the Cuban Missile Crisis, but the previous year with the um, Berlin Crisis, and the, especially the, uh, the building of the Berlin Wall in, uh, in August of 1961, and then the confrontation at Checkpoint Charlie in October. Um, the, there, too, the, the risk of war loomed over it. Those crises, and especially the Cuban Missile Crisis, brought policymakers so close to the brink. Even at the time, there was an awareness about um, the dangers of the Cuban Missile Crisis. You know, looking back, we know that those dangers were even greater than people realized at the time. But um, that brought in the third phase, which I would call roughly the more managed Cold War. And, um, again, there were still major uh, crises, those in the Middle East in 1973, um, in Central America in the 1980s, uh, in, in Afri the Horn of Africa in the 1970s, and so forth. There were standoffs, but there were, um, for the most part, these were somewhat more contained, not in the numbers of people who were being killed in the local conflicts, but at least in the the uh, likelihood that the two superpowers would come into direct conflict. Nonetheless, even during that final phase, um, that third phase of the Cold War, there still was that risk of a direct military confrontation. If, for example, the, uh, in 1973, the Arab-Israeli war had taken a wrong turn, there clearly was some risk of a U.S.-Soviet confrontation over it, even if the leaders on both sides didn't desire it. I think it's pretty clear that leaders on both sides were doing their best to avoid it. Nixon was deeply in trouble politically at the time, and so policy was being left more to Henry Kissinger and James Schlesinger as Secretary of Defense, and, um, and they clearly wanted to avoid one, but at the same time they had to be prepared to um, to get U.S. forces ready to engage uh, with Soviet forces if it came to that. 